Hi everyone, welcome to Classical Mechanics Lecture 4. Uh, this is part 1 of Lecture 4. Today we will start with a recap of, uh, the, um, of the previous lecture, where we have covered the principle of virtual work, of the D'Alembert's principle. that states that virtual work done by forces of constraint vanishes. And we can write it down uh, in the following more formal way. Force of the constraint times the displacement. Once summed up over all the particles, it gives us zero. As a result, this is an assumption so we have to be careful uh, when we're uh, when we're setting the work of forces of constraint equal to zero but for those systems for that wide class of systems where uh, we can do so we actually can get rid of the forces of constraint in the equations of motion and significantly simplify the consideration of the system. So when we do that, we actually can derive Lagrange's equations of motion uh, without any forces of constraint being present. And uh, this is precisely what we did. Uh, the equations uh, after we introduce the Lagrangian, which is the difference between the kinetic and potential energy, uh, looks like this. Uh, the equations look like that. The full time derivative of dl dq dot for uh, the uh, jth uh, generalized coordinate. Uh, the full derivative of this is equal to the partial derivative of q with respect to the same variable. So how can we understand that? Well, physically, um, this, as we will see, actually is uh, the momentum associated with the degree of freedom j. So this is kind of d p j d t and on the right hand side this is kind of uh, the force uh, that is uh, acting uh, in uh, the j, j direction that's not exactly true this is a simplification but this is an intuitive picture for the simplest choices of coordinates it actually uh, represents um, what's going on here so this is dp dt, mass times acceleration for a single particle, and on the right-hand side, uh, this is a force. So let's try now and make use of these equations of motion um, on a bunch of examples. And we already considered a few examples last time. Uh, namely, uh, we considered um, uh, a uh, particle on a spring, and uh, we also considered a free fall. So today, we're going to consider a few more examples. Uh, let me rattle them off really quickly. Uh, over here, uh, we'll consider a pendulum. Uh, we will also consider a particle in 2D uh, in polar coordinates. We will also consider a double pendulum. And uh, uh, we'll wrap it up uh, with a uh, falling rod on a frictionless table. So there will be a lot of excitement. Uh, in this lecture, so buckle up and uh, I'm going to see you in the next part of this lecture. Uh, welcome to part two of lecture four. Today, we're going to solve a bunch of different problems. 
and we're going to start with example three because two examples we already covered in the previous lecture. Uh, those were particle on a spring and uh, free fall. Now we're going to go on to example three, uh, which will be a pendulum. So uh, the pendulum that we're going to consider is a very simple one. It's a mass M attached to a rod of length L to a seating. Uh, let's start with the usual algorithm uh, with which we approach solving um, problems using Lagrange's approach. First of all, what is the number of degrees of freedom in this problem? Well, it's a two-dimensional pen pendulum. Let's consider two-dimensional pendulum for simplicity. Uh, so in this case, it can only oscillate back and forth uh, in the plane of the board. So that means that uh, we can describe it with just one parameter, which is the angle theta. Uh, from from the vertical. So the number of degrees of freedom is one and uh, our uh, generalized coordinate is theta. So with that, uh, we can now go ahead and try and write down what will be uh, the um, kinetic and potential energies. So the kinetic energy of the pendulum is mv theta over two. And because v theta is nothing but L times theta dot, uh, we can plug this in here. Uh, we're going to get that this is given by ML squared theta dot squared over two. Now, of course, we need to know what is the potential energy here because we'll need to write it out, of, co of course, as well. Uh, so the potential energy uh, we can write down if we introduce a y-axis pointing in the vertical direction. So this will be um, minus L times cosine theta, right? So that will be our y position. And therefore, the potential energy will be minus mg times L cosine theta. So with these, uh, we can write down that the Lagrangian is equal to t minus v. And it is therefore equal to ml squared theta dot squared plus mgl cosine theta. So what are the equations of motion? Uh, well, we can write them down uh, as such. Uh, so this is a kind of dp dt. So what will this be? Um, dl d d theta dot. If we take a derivative of um, L with respect to theta dot, theta dot is present only in one place over here in the kinetic energy. When we take the uh, derivative with respect to theta dot, the twos will cancel. So we're going to end up with m l square theta dot. And uh, then uh, we will also need to compute dl d theta, uh, which is the right-hand side of this equation, which is equal to the left-hand side. And this is uh, roughly the force. So what is dl d theta? Um, theta is present only in one place over here. Uh, so when we take the derivative, uh, we're going to get minus mgl sine theta. So from here, we're going to get the equations of motion that ml squared theta double dot is equal to minus mgl times sine theta. And uh, we can cancel off m. Uh, we can cancel off one of the l's. And uh, eventually, we're going to get that theta double dot is equal to minus g over l times sine theta. 
So that will be our equation of motion uh, for the pendulum. And what is amazing about uh, this process that we've just gone through is that nowhere did we need to use uh, the force of tension. Uh, no tension in the calculation. So this is amazing and we were able to do this because of the principle of virtual work or the D'Alembert's principle. Indeed, uh, the force of tension here is perpendicular to the displacement. So if we were to draw uh, the path, the, uh, the virtual displacement uh, here can point only perpendicular to the rod itself. Therefore, the uh, tension is perpendicular to the virtual displacement. Therefore, it cannot perform any work. So uh, D'Alembert's principle applies. And this is what we made use of here implicitly. So this is really exciting. Uh, we can now move on uh, to the next topic, uh, which will be a particle uh, in two-dimensional uh, central potential. This will be really exciting. Uh, come on over. Uh, please don't forget to do the quiz, and I'm going to see you in the next part three of the lecture four. Hey, hello. Welcome to part uh, three of lecture four. Uh, where we're going to consider example four, which is of a particle uh, in uh, uh, two-dimensional polar coordinates uh, with uh, a central potential. So the potential will be uh, V of R. So uh, what are we dealing with? Let's draw a diagram. So we have a particle of mass m, a uh, distance r from the origin of our uh, uh, polar coordinates, uh, and uh, with a polar angle of theta. So first things first. How many degrees of freedom does our system have? Well, here we can describe the position of this particle in a two-dimensional plane. Let's make it clear that it's a two-dimensional problem with just two numbers, distance from the origin and uh, the polar angle. So the number of degrees of freedom here is 2. Um, so what are the generalized coordinates? Q1 here will be r, and Q2 here will be theta. So with these, uh, we would like to express the kinetic and potential energy of a particle uh, sitting right here. So uh, how can we do that? Well. Um, the kinetic energy will be mv squared over 2, or uh, we can write it out as mx dot squared plus y dot squared over 2. So uh, how can we express x and y in terms of r and theta? Well, that's the conversion between uh, polar coordinates and Cartesian coordinates. So let's figure this out. X is R cosine theta. Uh, y is R sine theta, right? So if we were to this is Y, so X is R times cosine, uh, and Y is R times sine theta. So, but from here, we would be able to go to x dot, which is equal to r dot cosine theta, uh, and then plus r sine theta times theta dot. Then y dot 
will be r dot sine theta um, uh, plus or I guess here we should have had a minus, right? Because the derivative of cosine is minus sine. And here we will have a plus uh, with r in the front. So it will be r cosine theta, theta dot. OK. Uh, so we can now then take these and plug them into x dot and y dot in that expression. And we're going to continue uh, the expression for t over here. So it will be m over 2. Uh, and uh, we can see, once we plug this all in, that we're going to be left with just two terms, actually. r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared. And this is not surprising because this is nothing but v r squared, and that is nothing but v theta squared. So we just went from v x squared plus v y squared uh, to uh, another basis, which is rotated um, to v r squared plus v theta squared. Good. So that is our um, kinetic energy. And we can also write down what the potential energy is. Well, it's given to us by the problem. It's V of R. So understanding all of this, we can now write down Lagrangian, which will be T minus V. And it will be M over 2 R dot squared plus R squared times theta dot squared minus v of r. Fantastic. So how are we going to solve this? Now we have two degrees of freedom. Remember, right? So we would need to uh, write down two equations of motion. And uh, we're going to do that. So uh, equation of motion for theta. So what is equation of motion for theta? Uh, that uh, will be um, d dt uh, of dl d theta dot minus dl d theta, and all of that is equal to zero, right? That's Lagrange's equation of motion in the theta direction. So let's take a look at L. Clearly, uh, L does not depend on theta, right? There is no dependence on theta because the potential is uh, uh, central, so it only depends on the distance from the center, not the polar angle. And the kinetic energy doesn't depend on theta either. So it means that this term goes away. And we only left with this term, which we can rewrite as dl d theta dot, right? So what is that? It will be two, two will come out and cancel out. So we're going to get m r squared theta dot. And that is equal to zero. So what is this? This is nothing but conservation of angular momentum. Uh, indeed, uh, this is angular momentum. Uh, so you can write down L as m times r cross v, or uh, the uh, length of the angular momentum vector will be m r v theta. And uh, if we expand v theta in terms of r and theta dot, uh, we're going to get it is m r times r theta dot, or m r squared theta dot. So uh, this is nothing but the uh, conservation of angular momentum indeed. So awesome. So we've obtained uh, conservation of angular momentum as the equation of motion for theta and uh, equation of motion for radius uh, will give us the equation of motion for uh, the particle towards and away uh, from the center. 
So that will be zero equal to. Um, so it's DDT of DL DR dot. DL DR dot will be MR dot. Or we can replace all of this with MR double dot. And uh, minus DL DR. So let's see. DL DR. So there is R over here and there is R over there, so we will have two derivatives, two terms in the derivative. So we will have uh, R squared, um, derivative of that with respect to R will be 2R, twos will go away, so we'll get minus M R theta dot squared, and then we're going to have a uh, um, derivative of V, right, so that will be uh, plus because a minus sign over here, but there is also a minus sign over here, plus dv of r dr. So with this, we have been able to obtain equations of motion. Uh, the angular equation of motion uh, is giving us the conservation of angular momentum. And you can understand why this would be the case because there are no forces acting in the theta direction, therefore the angular momentum will be conserved. Um, and why there are no forces? Because the potential is central, um, so that the lines of constancy of the potential um, are circles. And so if a particle goes in a circle, there is no change in the potential, therefore there is no force. And uh, for the radial motion, we have been able to obtain uh, such a radial equation of motion that you can plug into the computer and solve it, or you can actually make some progress um, this equation uh, has been solved in various contexts in planetary dynamics and so on. We will actually be solving uh, it uh, analytically uh, to the full extent possible. You will see that later in the course. Okay, let me move on to the next problem, uh, which will be the double pendulum. So exciting. Don't forget to do the quiz. I'll be back. Hello, and welcome to part four of lecture four. We have now gotten to the exciting part, the double pendulum. This is our example five. For simplicity, we're going to consider a two-dimensional pendulum in one single plane. So what does the double pendulum look like? It looks just like the regular pendulum. But instead of one uh, segment has two. For simplicity, we'll consider both masses uh, at the ends of both rods to be equal. Both of the rods are of length L as well, so they are equivalent. So let us introduce a coordinate system. We will direct the y-axis to be vertical. X axis to be horizontal, and uh, we're going to draw a parallel axis here so that it's easy to do projections. So the coordinates of the first mass we will denote as y1, x1. The coordinates of the second mass we will denote as x2 and y2. So how are we going to solve this problem? Uh, well, let us introduce generalized coordinates. Well, if a single um, two-dimensional pendulum uh, has one degree of freedom, the attachment of the second arm of the pendulum means that there will be two degrees of freedom. Uh, so the number of degrees of freedom And uh, the two generalist coordinates that we can introduce are the angles of the first and the second arm of the pendulum. OK. 
Okay, so how are we going to um, compute the Lagrangian here? Well, for that we need to know the kinetic energy. So let's uh, write down the kinetic energy of the first mass first. Uh, it will be uh, exactly the same as for the simple single arm pendulum, uh, and it will be just like that. So what about T2, the kinetic energy of the second pendulum? Well, here things are a little bit more complicated because the motion of the second mass uh, is a combination of um, the motion of the first mass with the second uh, theta angle counting off of the position of the first one. So um, here let's try to switch to the Cartesian coordinates. When things are not clear, Cartesian coordinates are often uh, helpful. So let's see, uh, we can write it down as m over 2 times uh, v2 squared. It's no longer in a theta direction, so we'll just say V2. So what will that be, uh, V2? Well, it will be equal to X2 dot squared plus Y2 dot squared. So now we need to figure out what X2 and Y2 are. So let's do that. So X2 is going to be equal to the sum of x1 and uh, the difference between x2 and x1. So this segment uh, contributing to x1 is L times sine theta1. And here I will use a shorthand S for sine and C for cosine for compactness of notation. Uh, then we'll need to also add L times sine of uh, theta 2. Y2 is uh, equal to minus, because we're counting off in the negative direction, L times cosine theta 1. Cosine theta 1 minus L cosine theta 2. But what we will also need to know is the derivatives that are going to go in here. So let's try and compute those. x2 dot will be equal to L cosine theta 1 times theta 1 dot. For y2, we can do the same. So it will be L times sine theta 1 times theta 1 dot plus L sine theta 1. Oops, sine theta, not, yes, theta 2. Okay, times theta 2 dot. Let's double check. So 1, 1, 2, 2. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, so these now can go in here. So let's take this further. So let's take this over here. Uh, so T2 continues. T2 is equal to M over two. Let us take L factor it out. So we'll have cosine theta 1 squared plus ah, theta 1 squared times theta 1 dot squared plus cosine theta 2 squared times theta 2 dot squared plus 2 cosine theta 1 times cosine theta 2 times theta 1 dot times theta 2 dot. Plus 
plus. Uh, we'll have sine theta 1 squared times theta 1 dot squared plus sine theta 2 squared times theta 2 dot squared plus the cross product between the two, 2 sine theta 1 times sine theta 2 times theta 1 dot times theta 2 dot. Ooh, okay, this looks long, but there are things that are good. So for instance, the sum of these two gives us 1, and so does the sum of these two also one. And um, the sum of these two gives us cosine of theta 1 minus theta 2. So as a result, we are going to get ml squared over 2 times a theta 1 dot plus theta 2 dot both squared plus a 2 cosine theta 1 minus theta 2 times theta 1 dot times theta 2 dot. So that is the expression for the kinetic energy. Great, so we have T1, we have T2. Now all that's left for us to compute Lagrangian, which is our final goal, is to write down what V1 and V2 are. So I will carve out some space over here for that. So what is V1? Well, V1 is simply minus uh, well, uh, it's mgy1, right? And y1 is minus L cosine theta 1, so it will be minus L cosine theta 1. V2 will be mgy2, uh, right? mg times y2. So what is that? It will be mgl cosine theta 1 plus cosine theta 2. So it's the sum of both. And so when we add it all up, our Lagrangian is T1 plus T2 minus V1 minus V2. It's going to be equal to ML squared over 2. So it will be, let's take out m l squared over 2 open bracket so from here we'll get theta 1 dot squared and from here we'll have another one so we'll have 2 theta 1 dot squared plus theta 2 dot squared plus 2 cosine theta 1 minus theta 2 times theta 1 dot times theta 2 dot. All right. And then uh, we will need to uh, subtract off V1 and V2. And V1 and V2, they both come with minus signs, so those minus signs will go away. And we'll get uh, two cosine theta 1 terms and one cosine theta 2 terms. MGL cosine theta 1 
times two, right? So we will have two of these terms, two cosine theta one plus cosine theta two. All right. So now we have gotten our expression for the Lagrangian, which is this. So let's save this. We will need this in the next lecture. Just one more thing. Uh, we are going to have a chance to simulate a double pendulum later in the course. I will offer you an extra credit problem set uh, where you will actually be able to solve the ordinary, dif ordinary differential equations that describe uh, the double pendulum numerically and you will be able to explore really exciting aspects of uh, double pendulum like transition to chaos. Um, so that's it for part four of lecture four and I'm going to see you in uh, part five of lecture four. Hello, hello. Welcome to the last part five of lecture four. Uh, we're now going to drop a rod on a frictionless table. So let's drop a rod on a frictionless table. How are we going to do that? Well, uh, let's first draw a picture. So we have uh, a table over here. We have a uniform rod like this, um, where its center of mass is given by XCM and YCM coordinates. The mass of the rod is M, and we could introduce an angle theta uh, that would characterize the orientation of the rod. So, how many degrees of freedom do we have? Well, um, let's see. So, because the rod, let's assume that the rod never leaves the table, so it always is sliding on it by one end at least. So, in this case, um, we can slide it uh, left and right, and we can also choose how inclined it is, um, what's the angle of theta. So we can pick two parameters that parameterize it, the uh, coordinate, x-coordinate of the center of mass and the angle that the rod makes uh, with the table. So there are two degrees of freedom, and we're going to have q1 equal to the x-coordinate and q2 will be equal to theta, the angle that the rod makes with the table. So now let's try and write down uh, what the kinetic energy and the potential energy of the rod are. So the kinetic energy of the rod, um, ooh, that is tough, right? Because the rod is uniform. So um, the rod, um, if theta changes, then it all moves together at the same time. So how, how are we going to attack this problem? I mean, it's difficult. I don't know what to do. So maybe we can, because if it was a point particle, then we would know, right? It would be just the kinetic energy of the center of mass, but there is more, right? And remember when we dealt with the uh, systems of particles uh, that involve rotation, uh, for the angular momentum, we had a contribution from the center of mass motion plus another contribution from the rotation itself. And with the energy, we're going to get probably something similar. So let's think about it. Um, let's break down the rod into little pieces. Um, so we can write down that the kinetic energy is the sum over all those pieces, mi 
vi squared over 2. Right, so this is the sum of all the kinetic energies of the different pieces that the rod is made up of. Um, so then uh, let's try in analogy with the um, angular momentum, let us try and uh, break it down into the kinetic energy associated with the motion of the center of mass of the rod plus the rest. So let's see how that works. So uh, we will say this, and here the i will be the sum of v of the center of mass plus v prime i, which is the difference in velocity between the velocity of the center of mass and uh, uh, v i. So this is equal to v i minus VCM. So this is inequality. And then let's try and uh, uh, take the square here. So we will have VCM squared plus uh, we will also have a cross term which will be 2VCM dotted into vi prime plus we'll also have vi prime squared. Uh, now let's think about the mean of all these terms and how we can massage them into something that's useful. So first of all here for this term we can take vcm out of the sum, right? Because it's a constant. Uh, here we can also take VCM out of the sum. So let's try and do that. So the first term when we take VCM out of the sum we're just going to get MVCM squared over 2. So this is nothing but, let me use the green marker here, this is nothing but the kinetic energy associated with the motion of the center of mass. Good. Um, what about the other terms? Plus this term, uh, here we can take VCM out, the twos will go away, cancel out, and we're going to get VCM times the sum of M I V I prime. And maybe you remember that this by the definition of the center of mass will actually add up to zero. In full analogy at what we had in the case of angular momentum. Finally, we have one last term, which will be the sum over i of m i over 2 times v i prime squared. So this term is nothing but the kinetic energy relative to the center of mass because it involves a mass of each particle making up the rod uh, times the square of the velocity which is a relative to the center of mass. So the total kinetic energy is the sum of the uh, kinetic energy of the center of mass plus the kinetic energy relative to the center of mass. Let me take this down here. So this is really important. Uh, we're going to be using this uh, very often 
uh, when we have a complex motion of a rigid body uh, that involves rotation to compute its kinetic energy. So to repeat, the total kinetic energy of a moving uh, body is the kinetic energy associated with the motion of its center of mass as if all of its mass is stuck in a single point particle that moves the same way as the center of mass of the system of particles or body moves plus the kinetic energy relative to the center of mass so we jump into the frame of the center of mass uh, that moves to get instantaneously with the center of mass at the same velocity as the center of mass and uh, we compute what is the kinetic energy uh, in that frame. So that is the kinetic energy relative to the center of mass. So now let's try and use this here to compute the total kinetic energy. This term is pretty clear, uh, the kinetic energy of the center of mass, but the other term, this one, the non-zero term, the one that is relative to the center of mass is more complicated. So let's draw a diagram here. So if we have a rod like this and it's rotating around its center of mass, right? So that's the center of mass with an angular frequency of theta dot. Um, then how could we compute its kinetic energy? Well, let us integrate. Let's introduce a coordinate R and uh, the points at this distance will have value of theta velocity, which is r times theta dot. So let's try and compute TRCM. It will be an integral in r from minus l over 2 to l over 2, right? Uh, and uh, when we sum up every piece of the rod, um, we need to sum up the mass over 2 times velocity squared. So it will be uh, dm divided by 2 times velocity squared. What is the velocity squared here? Uh, it will be r theta dot squared. Okay, so what are we going to do with dm? Well, if we had the full rod, then uh, it would be just m. And uh, if we have a length dr of the rod, it will be dr over the total length times m. So this m we can write out as dr over l times m. So now we can write out the integral in the following way. We'll have dr over L times m. So all of that is dm uh, and then we'll have r squared theta dot squared over 2. Uh, so let's now see what we can do with that. Um, L is a constant, M is a constant. Uh, so we can take them out. 2 is a constant. We can take it out. Theta dot is also a constant. So we can take a bunch of things out from under the integral. So we're going to get M theta dot squared over 2L. And inside the integral, we're going to get minus L to L over 2 of what are we going to get? R squared dr, right? So uh, this integral is going to give us um, R cube over 3 and we're going to have to substitute from minus L over 2 to L over 2. So what will that be? Uh, it will be L cubed over 8 and then divided by 3. So it will be L cubed over um, 24. Uh, and then minus, minus that. 
so it will be twice that so it will be l cubed divided by 12. so that's good so it means now we know what the answer is for the kinetic energy relative to the central mass uh, which will be m theta dot squared over 2l and then all of this is l cubed over 12. Uh, so we will cancel one out and we're going to get that the answer is ml squared theta dot squared divided by 24. So that is TRCM and TCM is nothing but um, M over 2 and then VCM uh, will be so what will VCM be so it will be the kinetic energy of the motion so it will be XCM squared plus y dot cm squared, right? Um, what will be the potential energy? Potential energy will be mg um, y cm, right? Okay, that's good so it will be mg and ycm will be l over 2 so the whole thing is l and so half of it will be l over 2 so it will be l over 2 times sine theta okay so we now have gotten the uh, potential energy because uh, if we were to integrate, if we were to sum up all the potential energies, we were going to end up with the um, potential energy associated with the center of mass. Um, so that's why only the center of mass enters here in the total mass. And uh, for the kinetic energy, uh, XCM is our uh, one of our variables. So the only thing is we need to write out what YCM dot squared is. So YCM is this, so we can write down that uh, this is equal to M over two times XCM squared plus um, L over two times cosine theta, theta dot, all squared. So that is our kinetic energy associated with the center of mass. So now we are all ready to uh, write down uh, what our um, Lagrangian is. So it will be TCM plus TRCM minus V. TCM is m over 2 times x dot cm squared plus l squared over 4 plus trcm uh, which will be l squared theta squared over 24 uh, and uh, then uh, we will have to um, subtract the potential energy which is mg l over 2 sine theta and uh, this is our awesome uh, Lagrangian Uh, for a falling rod on uh, a slippery table in two dimensions. Uh, so I hope this was useful uh, and fun, and uh, please don't forget to do the last quiz of this lecture.
and I'm going to see you in the next lecture five where we will uh, introduce Hamilton's principle of least action. That's my favorite principle. See you there. Bye.